Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This evening, Howard Olson is training us how to increase our sales by simplifying our selling. Howard, welcome. Hey, thank you, Roger. It's great to be with you, man. You're an old friend, and I'm just delighted to be with you and your, and your audience here tonight, many of whom I know. Is it uh, okay if I ask you a couple of little questions that people can read about you when they read your bio? Sure. You, let's, see, let's see what you come up with. All right. Give us a bit of a handle on what you do for fun. Oh, well, I, I like all kinds of things. I'm, uh, I, I'm pretty adventurous. You know, I've lived, in, uh, I've lived in five different countries and all on multiple continents. So I love traveling. I love exploring and immersing myself into other cultures. But, you know, this year we haven't had much of that. Uh, my wife and I both, her name is Michaela. We're both, uh, I would call ourselves foodies or gourmet aficionados. I love, I love cooking. We've got a well-equipped kitchen. So I like, I, love, I love cooking and making a great meal and doing that for friends. So we frequently are known for entertaining. Uh, you know, I've got over 5,000 CDs, so I do, I spend a lot of, have a lot of music around me constantly, but I'm also an avid motorcyclist. And, uh, last summer, two summers ago, I actually took the Harley. So I got a, I got a couple of bikes, but I got this one great big touring machine and we went literally from Victoria all the way to PEI down to Halifax and back again, 17,000 kilometers in four weeks, all the way around the Great Lakes and saw this whole country from the perspective of a motorcycle. So I love, I love all that kind of stuff. You know, I've known you for 20 years and you've just told me brand new information. I had no idea. Okay, ask me for one thing that nobody would know about me. Ask, Howard, why don't you tell us <laughs> one thing that nobody knows about you? I sang in a rock band in Hong Kong for five years. Oh my God. <laughs> Really? <laughs> I did, yeah. That I mean, that wasn't my lot. job. That was that was kind of my after work gig. But you know, they didn't pay us money. They paid us in beer. And some days they wished that they were paying us cash. <laughs> so, right. Okay. All right. Well, let's segue into the content of your uh, talk. Uh, <clears throat> bet. Uh, audience, uh, uh, Howard is going to ask you to hold your questions until the end. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, please uh, pop, well, I'll let him tell you the specifics. Uh, I'm recording this video and it's going to be made public on the VBN YouTube channel before noon tomorrow. You bet. It, it might even before I make it to bed tonight. Uh, but in any event, I'll send you a link. Uh, so you don't have to take notes if you don't want. The recording will be uh, online uh, no later than noon tomorrow. Howard, are so. you ready to rock the stage? Yeah, let's do it. Then, then you do it to us. Take it our away, virtual, Howard. our virtual stage here. Yeah. Well, hey, good evening, everybody, and listen. Thanks again. I, I sat in. I listened to everybody's problem with sales and stood there for the, you know, what you're asking, all the rest of that. So I'm really glad to be here with you. And you know, tonight's presentation, we we called it "Amplify Your Revenue by Simplifying Your Sales." But at the end of the day, what I really would like to encourage you is sometimes we just got to get back to basics. And, and sales solves everything. Now, as Roger was saying, I'm going to try to give you a lot of content tonight. There's not much fat in the words that I speak. So I, I want to encourage you to get out a pen and paper, take notes of what I'm saying here, even though it's recorded. And also write down whatever questions you have. And what I would like to, because I'm going to try to piece together a couple of independent pieces of information and string them together so it makes sense for you so that I can give you some content that you can literally start using as early as tomorrow morning. So hold your questions till the end. If you want to put them in the chat room, that's okay. I'm just going to ask that we don't interrupt the presentation to address them. We'll come back and get them. So make note of your questions and let's go. But here's my first question to you. What would your, what would your business and what would your life look like? if selling wasn't such a hassle. I mean, I know some of you tonight said that, you know, selling really isn't a problem for you. You rather enjoy it, but you know, you are in the minority. I've talked to all, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people over, the, over 30 years or more. And most people have a real aversion to this whole issue around selling. And so I want to make this dead simple for you tonight. And, and if we can do that, then selling doesn't need to be a problematic area. And the reason I do what I do is because I've just seen way too many people needlessly struggle around this whole issue of sales and revenue generation. One, because they've got kind of maybe a, a faulty paradigm around it and because nobody's ever modeled a better way. So when I run a workshop, you know, it's multiple days. I'm going to try to cram as much as I can into 45 minutes without giving you too much of a fire hose so that it actually still makes sense for you. Now, 
We've all heard this expression, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough, and if you were going to complete that sentence, when the going gets tough, the tough, get going. And I say, no, nope. when the going gets tough, the tough pivot. And this is exactly the kind of year that we've had. You know, this is a year when our whole world got turned upside down. Many of you have already learned to adapt to the new environment we find ourselves in. Some are still pivoting around that, but you know, our life is a series of pivots. For the majority of my life, I was a corporate sales guy. I, was, uh, I worked for a $40 billion company. I was director of global accounts. I had thousands of salespeople reporting for me and literally turning on hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue with Fortune 5 type companies. When I moved to Vancouver with a Fortune 5 resume, there, you know, there wasn't much of an opportunity here for me. And I found myself in the very first pivot, part of which birthed this training company. And so I had to pivot in that. Um, you know, as, uh, as COVID came on board this year, I had, you know, listen, my whole calendar got wiped out. I'm, I'm a conference speaker. I speak at conferences all over the world. And with one snap of a finger, my entire year got wiped right off the map. I was forced to pivot once again and took everything online. I'm actually now using the things that I do to help other companies broker their own deals. But the one thing that all of the activities I've ever been involved in it all, the commonality is that it all involves integritous selling. And, and so I want to talk to you about that tonight because we've all heard this expression, you know, nothing happens until something gets sold. And it's true. Sales, revenue, lifeblood, customer acquisition. The, these, are, these are the lifeblood of our, of our organizations. They, it feeds our, our vision, our mission. It, in fact, it feeds the, our very livelihoods. And yet the majority of people basically have some aversion to this whole thing called selling. And if we're going to have any success whatsoever, we need to help them redef redefine that so that they can actually embrace this very activity. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we are all in sales, every single one of us, you know, and I would, I would put it to you like this, you know, everyone in every line of work has to sell. Uh, job candidates, they sell themselves to get hired. Managers are selling ideas to their, to their bosses and to their staff. Parents sell their kids on going to bed and doing their homework. CEOs are selling strategic initiatives to their boards. And yes, salespeople and small business owners and entrepreneurs, we're also selling our products and services to bring in needed revenue and much needed clients. And so we're all in sales. And I think the minute we get our head wrapped around that and we can find a better way to approach this subject, we can get a lot of the stresses away from it and start predictably increasing, you know, our successfulness with it. Now I want to, before I go any further, I want, one of the things I want to talk about is that very often you'll hear these two words used in the same sentence, sales and marketing, sales and marketing. Those are two words that are very often put in the same sentence, but they really shouldn't be because they're two very different ideas. You know, marketing is the whole activity of generating interest. So whether it's social media campaigns or running videos, and I, talk, I heard some of you tonight saying, you know, listen, I pick up the phone, I, I, I try to generate some interest. Well, that's, that's, that's a marketing activity, that's prospecting. Selling is the activity of generating or turning generated interest into profitable customers. And so sales and marketing, although they have some commonality and they actually share some common activities, they are two fundamentally different uh, spheres of activity to run your business. And so I want to focus tonight on, on this whole issue of selling and the conversation that converts interest into revenue and customers and doing it in an authentic dialogue, genuine, trustworthy way. So that's really where I want to go with all of this. But if we're going to, if, if we're going to talk about this, then we have to, you know, we have to give it some definitions. So the first definition of selling, I've got three of them I'm going to share tonight because you, you cannot take this whole concept of selling and give it just one definition. It takes all kinds of different perspectives. So I would say that selling is expressing your ideas from somebody else's point of view. Now, I want you to look at this picture of Prince William over here and you, you hear, you know, listen, it's very easy to make an assumption. But if you start to take a 360 degree view of things, you all of a sudden begin to realize that maybe your initial information wasn't correct and you didn't really understand what was going on. And this happens in selling all the time that we walk into meetings making a series of assumptions and based on those assumptions start making a presentation that may or may not even be relevant because we're trying to address a need that we don't even understand. So selling number one is expressing your ideas from somebody else's perspective, but it's absolutely impossible to express your ideas from their perspective if you don't know what it is first. And not what we assume it is, what we know it is 
because they told us. Now, they're not just, you're not going to walk into a meeting and they're just going to start telling you what they're, we have to dance around this a little bit. And that's what we're going to get into. That's going to be the meat of the subject matter this evening. So another second definition for selling is it's selling is, is, is basically positive influence with people. You know, many of you would know or will have heard of John Maxwell. John Maxwell's written like 50 books on the subject of leadership. I happened to speak at the same conference as he did a number of years ago. We were milling around backstage and I've read most of his books. And, and I said to John, I said, hey, listen, I said, you know, I just smiled at him, kind of made a joke. I said, hey, John, 50 books, that's a lot of words on leadership. If you could get leadership down to just one sentence, if you get it down to one sentiment, what would it be? And without skipping a beat, he just, he said, easy. Leadership is positive influence with people. It's getting the best out of people because you have positive influence with them. And I said, well, that's amazing. I said, because I've always said that selling is positive influence with people. So if selling is positive influence with people and leadership is positive influence with people, then selling really at the end of the day is just leadership. So we have to have this properly defined. In fact, I would go so far as to say that selling is, is servant leadership in action. Now, you want to make it really simple. Selling is an authentic, organic, natural conversation that produces results. And so I listen to many of you like Karen, I just hate feeling like they, you know, like I've got a hidden agenda creating that. And, you know, I don't like selling. I, I don't like uh, forcing people to have to pay. Listen, selling doesn't have anything to do with this. Like I said before, we're all in sales. CEOs are selling strategic initiatives to their boards. It's about the transmission of an idea that is positively and proactively received. Now, sometimes there's a transaction involved in it. But selling doesn't, isn't always transactional. Selling isn't always monetary. And the principles of non-transactional selling and the principles of transactional selling are the same. It's about authentic, genuine dialogue that produces results. All right. Now, at the end of the day, here's what I would say to you. In 2,000 years, nothing's really changed. I mean, yes, the, the methods of communication, the vehicles that we use, perhaps the, you know, our language has changed. You know, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and all these kind of things didn't exist. Zoom didn't exist. So the, the, the methods of communication have changed. But at the end of the day, the fundamentals of human connection and building trust amongst human beings has never changed. So if you want to be successful in selling anything, you just got to get back to basics. And it really comes down to creating environments of trust so that an act of faith can take place. So there's another definition of selling for you. Now, I've, I've, been, in, I've been at this, oh, I guess now looking at my, I've been at this for 40 years, 40 plus years. And in all those years, now I've lived in Hong Kong and I've lived in Australia. I've done business in over 37 countries. I've worked with small mom and pop kind of organizations and I've sold to some of the biggest companies on this planet. You know, and here's what I've discovered. There are three universal truths to selling anything, anywhere, to anyone on this planet that transcends cultural, national, or gender boundaries, has absolutely nothing to do with that. And in fact, has very little to do with your product or service. Now, you got to have the right thing. You got to be at the right place at the right time with the right solution to an issue. But notwithstanding any of that, if it comes down to you and a competitor, there are three universal truths to selling anything. And here's, so let me just share them with you, okay? And I'm going to go pretty quickly here. Truth number one, 75% of the outcome of any selling opportunity. Now, if you're still hung up on this word selling, you may freely substitute selling, communicating, influencing. 75% of the outcome of any communicating opportunity, whether you succeed or fail, comes down to the manner in which you establish trust, rapport, and relevance in the initial stages of your dialogue with another human being. And those are the two big words here, trust and relevance, trust and relevance. Let me ask you something. You ever met somebody and inside of the first 10 to 15 seconds, your instinct said, I don't know what it is, looks good, smells good, but I, there's just something here I intrinsically don't trust, true or false. And in the back of your head, you're already going, you know, I'm going to be polite and I'm going to smile, but this is going nowhere. True or false? We've all been there. Three quarters of whether you succeed or fail comes down to the manner in which we engender trust and relevance in the initial stages. And one of the things that we actually do, I don't have time to get into it all night. A lot of it's all about the perception that somebody else has of us. 
okay? What is our body language? What's our tone of voice? And we're doing everything we do either creates trust or destroys it, puts up a wall or takes it down. Very often, even outside our conscious awareness. And so one of the things that we do that makes our program so much different is we, yes, we'll give you a great sales process, but we start with an understanding of how you as a human being create the environment that either enables it to go forward or not. In other words, three quarters comes down to trust and relevance. And we've always heard this, this saying, many of us have heard it, always be closing, always be closing, trial close. Would you forget about all that? Listen, when you learn how to open, closing takes care of itself. Truth number two, every single human being on this planet will make exactly five critical decisions in a precise psychological order before you can sell, convince, or persuade them of anything. Not six, not four, five. Always these five. In what kind of order? In a precise order. What does that mean? It means not random, not sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't do it. Always this order. These are the critical buying decisions that your customers are making when you come into their presence. Here they are. If I'm selling and you're buying, if you're selling and your customer's buying, here's the first thing they're thinking. Do I like, it's about you. The first decision is you. Do I like you and do I trust you? And like I said before, what's going on in the back of their mind? I don't know what it is, but you know, I, uh, there's just something here. I intrinsically like it. I'm going to drop my guard and begin to cooperate with you or, you know, this is going to go nowhere. Your second decision. So here's what they're, I mean, here's what they're actually thinking. Are you here for my reasons or for your reasons? Are you trying to sell me or are you genuinely trying to help me? And this is all happening in the back of their mind based on their observation of how this conversation is unfolding and how you came into that environment. I'm going to help you understand that really deeply this evening. Decision number two is about your company. Here's what they're thinking. Okay, I like and trust you, but who are you? What's, what's your reputation? And by the way, even if you're self-employed, you know, for all intents and purposes, I'm self-employed. I mean, I got an accountant and I got, I've got a virtual assistant, but I am the company. I'm the intellectual property. I've created all the product, but me and company are separate entities, you know, because here's what the customer's thinking right now. Okay, I like and trust you. And now, but I, now that I got a relationship with you, who are you guys? What's your reputation? What does the market say about you? Why are you excited to be with them? Why should I be excited to be a customer? And, what are, and who's got my back in your absence? Since they, they're thinking all this kind of stuff. So we have to come up with a way to articulate the value of the organizations we represent, even if we're self-employed solopreneurs. Decision number three is about your product or service. And here's what they're thinking now. Okay, I like and trust you. I like and trust your organization. I can see you got a great reputation. But here's, what they're, here's, the, here's the question. Does what you do fix a problem satisfy a need, want, or desire, or will you somehow make my life easier? And here's exactly where 90% of sales go right off the rail, 90% right off the top. This is where they fall to pieces because we walk into a meeting. Okay. So we come in, we shake hands and thank God for the weather. Without that, most conversations would never get started. But at some eventuality, the customers or the prospect of the customer is going to say, hey, thanks. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming. And then they're going to launch out with something like this. So what have you got for me today? Or what makes you different? What do you think you can do for us? Or some variation of a question like this. And because they've asked us this question, we feel compelled now that we have to answer it. So we go into presentation mode. We go into pitch mode and we start making a presentation because we know what we do so well. And we start presenting how we think we can help them. But here's the problem. The minute you start addressing that question, you start addressing a need that there's no way that you can possibly understand yet because selling is expressing your ideas from somebody else's point of view, but you don't know what their point of view is. They've asked you a generic question. So what do you think you can do for me? Or what makes you different? And you started making a presentation around a need that you don't understand. And secondarily, if three quarters of it comes down to the trust that you established in the beginning, you haven't done any of that yet. And now you run the risk of making a completely irrelevant presentation, even though it might be powerful, it might even be true. It doesn't mean it's relevant to the one you're sitting in front of because you really don't understand what's going on inside their own mind yet. And so I'm gonna teach you tonight how to never fall into this conversational traps so that you can actually have an organic conversation where they'll tell you everything they're thinking so that you can make a presentation that aligns with where they're at. Decision number four is all about price. People, and here's what they say, okay, I like and trust you. I like and trust your company. Okay, okay, I can see how what you do fixes my problem or addresses my need set because you took the time to listen to me. 
But the fourth decision is never, it's not, people don't buy price, they buy value. Think about this. When you go shopping, do you buy purely on price or do you buy on the value it represents? Now, price is one of the ingredients that goes into value. And in my experience, especially in B2B sales, when we're dealing with, with, you know, with customers, there are three ingredients that go into creating a strong value proposition. One, they see value in a relationship with you because they like you, they trust you, and they understand that you understand them. They see you as a valuable business partner. You actually become part of the value proposition. Two, they see value in a relationship with your organization because of the outstanding reputation that it has. And they can see now that they're pro you're probably the best match for their agreed upon needs set. And three, they see value in the product or service that you bring to the table because you've been able to make a presentation that completely aligns and dovetails with the needs as expressed by them, not as assumed by you. But that takes a rejigging of how we have this conversation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show that to you in just a second. And last but not least, the fifth decision is about time. And here's what I'm thinking right now. Okay, I like and trust you. I, I can see how you can actually help me. I can see that you're here to definitely help me, that what you're offering fixes my problem. And, and I can see value in all of that. The last decision that they're gonna make is, can you fill this need? Can you deliver within my time frame? Or is this the appropriate time for me to be making this decision? Like, I'll give you an example. I've got a client that I'm working with right now. We've come to an agreement. They want to work together. They got a full team they want to go after. We agreed on everything except time. At the end of the day, he came and said, listen, we're just finishing up our year end and we got auditors and accountants running through all of our books. Can we put this off until November? No problem. Here's what I want you to understand. And it goes back to decision number one. You know, you can't close a sale before you open it. And when you learn how to open, closing takes care of itself. Number five, you don't control time. Your customer controls time. So again, in this market where we keep hearing people say, you know, always be closing. I say, forget about it. Learn how to properly open, build deep levels of trust, relevance, and the close will take care of itself. They'll want to do business with you. All right. So those are, those, are, those are your five critical decisions. And truth number three. So I said there's three truths. Truth one, 75% comes down to how you open. Truth two, everybody makes those five decisions. And by the way, I run the dating course in our church and I, it's the same five decisions. Okay. Do we like each other? Do we want a second date? Yep. Okay. We've been dating for a couple of months now. Maybe our parent, we should meet, you should meet my parents. I should. So that's the company. That's your background. Okay. Product. Okay. We've been together for a while. What, what does our life together look like? Price. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it, this is, we've been around with each other for long enough. Looks like we're, uh, you know, we're an item. Every, there's a compromise for you and a compromise for me. I'm going to have to give up and make some concessions. That's the price. And then five, hey, buddy, put a ring on it. Okay. So those, it's the same five decisions. You just reframe the context. It's always those five decisions. Okay. So truth number three is you have to ask for the sale or you have to ask for the next appropriate commitment. Here it is, 62% of the time, according to all the research that I've read, both anecdotally and studied, 62% of the time, even trained professionals don't ask for the next step commitment, which could be closing the sale. It could just be say, hey, listen, if we can get together next Thursday and go through a proposal that I'll prepare for you, can you think of any reason why we shouldn't do that? But most people never even get the follow-up appointment because they never asked for it. They never understood that every meeting needs to have an agreed upon conclusion. There needs to be a call to action. And if you don't ask, you don't get. What we do is we teach you a painless and pressure-free way to ask the right question at the right time for the right reason so it doesn't feel manipulative. Okay. So if those five, if those three truths are true and these five decisions are true, and I can tell you after 40 years and having trained tens of thousands of people in both small and large organizations, I can tell you it is absolutely true. So here's what we do in our workshops and seminars. What we do is we take these five decisions and we sequence them into a natural and organic conversational action plan that we call the sales blueprint so that everybody can actually create their highly customized sales blueprint and walk away with a conversational action plan that rotates around the five decisions but is natural and organic and holistic and synergistic with you. I don't want to change who you are. I just want to give you a better structure. And so that's really what, what this is really all about. All right. Tonight in the time that I've got left, what I want to focus in on is this, this final piece, this last piece. People don't buy price, they buy value. So I want to help you understand how we can begin to create value in the mind of the customer 
because people hate to be sold, man, but they sure do love a good purchasing experience. And when they perceive value, they want to buy from you. So I want to focus in on that. So I'm, I'm going to leave you with three keys. Okay. First thing I want you to realize every human being, if you don't remember anything from this presentation, remember this, every human being on this planet hungers to be heard and understood. In fact, I would say it like this, every human being on this planet hungers to be profoundly heard and understood. Ellen DeGeneres once put it like this, to be loved is wonderful, to be understood is profound. Right? How many people have said, how are you doing? And you know for sure they were not listening to your answer. It was just a polite pleasantry. We all want to be heard. We all want to be understood. That means I want it, you want it. But more importantly, what I'm empowering you with is the understanding that your customers want it. And when they feel heard and understood by you, their trust goes through the roof. And that is the key ingredient to unlocking 75% of the sale. And two, customers don't buy products or services. They buy outcomes. I'm going to make this really clear in just a second. Okay. And last but not least, it's you. You actually are the sale. You are the conduit between the company and the customer, the product and the customer, the service and the customer. It all starts with you. Value begins with you. Listen, you are in the people. You might be in the marketing business. You might be in the technology business. You might be in the art business, but you know what? You know what my business and your business have in common? I'm a people, you're a people, and all of our customers are people. We are in the people business and it's your applied people smarts. Catch this, it's your applied people smarts that make your product, service, and technical knowledge pay off. We're in the people business, guys. Don't ever forget that, all right? So here's the first big takeaway and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through this. I'm gonna give you three core things that you can begin doing immediately tomorrow. I want you to start thinking outcome and talking results. Think outcome. Instead of talking about what you do, talk about the results that you generate. All right, I believe in cause and effect. You know, listen, if you kick over the first domino and they're lined up properly, all those dominoes are going to come around and they're all going to fall. I want to use me as an example to, to highlight what I'm talking about here. Listen, so, you know, now I'm in the personal development and training space. I do, train, I do training workshops. I do personal development programs. I do coaching. I do consulting. Those are all just delivery vehicles. I do keynote speeches at, at conferences all over the world. But I can tell you, in the last 25 years, no one's ever hired me because they wanted a speech. No one's ever hired me because they wanted to sit through another training program. They hired me. Like if I'm doing a corporate engagement, and I really dig into, you know, why did you hire him? Why, why are you looking at this? You know, we've got an employee morale issue and our sales have been slumping. I need you to encourage our people, lift their morale and help us increase our sales. They didn't want a speech. They didn't want a training program. They wanted increased morale and better results. The thing that I do is just a vehicle for giving them the result that they are after. Now, some of you might be in the financial services business. Listen, nobody wants a financial plan. I, give, I, I make highly personalized financial plan. Nobody wants a financial plan. What do they want? I want to provide for my kids. I want to put away for tomorrow without having to sacrifice for today. So start thinking in terms of the outcome. What happens? What are you really selling? And what happens when somebody buys what it is that you offer? And quit talking about what you do. Start talking about what they get. And because this is the key to the whole thing. All right. So think outcome. I want to, I'm going to make, I'm going to, I'm going to throw three, three images up on the screen here to really help you visualize this, to help you get your head wrapped around it. Okay. Now everybody on this call either owns a drill or at some point in time has held or used one. All right. I know Dor Doris over there, Doris Anderson. I mean, she puts up these screens, she hangs artwork. I know for sure she's got a drill. All right. So my question is, okay. Here's a picture of a drill. What do you do with a drill? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, uh, because we're on mute, okay, so with a drill, you make a hole. So my question is, did you want the drill or did you want the hole? Okay, but then we can ask another question. Why did you want the hole? So I'm gonna throw you three, I'm gonna put up three pictures that are almost identical, just different people. So let's look at this lady here. So what it, in her hand she has a, and if you wanna just you know, play along with me under your breath or you can just talk to your screens even though we can't hear each other. So in her hand she has a drill. And with that drill she's making a hole. And with that hole she's hanging a shelf. So did she want the drill? No. Did she want the hole? No. Did she want, what did she want? Did she want a shelf? 
maybe. So why does she want the shelf? Because every time you think you've arrived at the answer, you can just ask one more question. Why did you want fill in the blank with what came before it? Why does she want the shelf? So let's just say that I went and had a conversation with her. And I said, so, hey, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm putting up a shelf. Why? Listen, my kids are two and four. They're into everything. They're crawling around. You know, and the laundry detergent has been down here for way too long. I need to get this up off the floor. I need to create a neat, clean, uh, safe environment for my kids. So now let's go back. In her hand, she's got a drill. She's made a hole. She put up a shelf. But did she actually want the shelf? No. She wanted a neat, safe, safe clean environment for her kids. But she needed a drill to produce that outcome. All right, now here's another one. Here's a guy. Now it's almost the same thing. It's even almost the same drill. So let's play this game again. So what's he got? So here's a guy. What's he got? In his hand, he has a drill. And with that drill, he's making a hole. And with that hole, he's hanging a shelf, albeit a different kind of shelf. He's basically doing the same thing. So did he want the drill? Nope. Did he want the hole? Nope. Did he want the shelf? Maybe not. So I went over and I asked him, say, hey, what are you doing here? What, why, why, what are you doing? He says, well, listen, my wife has been on me for the last six months every week. And it's like, would you get that shelf up? Would you get that shelf up? So on one hand, I just, want, I just want some peace and quiet. But on the other hand, she told me no more golf until I get this shelf up. So did he want the drill? Nope. Did he want the hole? Nope. Did he want the shelf? Nope. What did he want? He wanted to go golfing with his buddies. Okay, so I'm kind of making a joke out of this, but you get it. Two people, for all intents and purposes, doing exactly the same thing, each looking for an entirely different outcome. And the same is true for each of your customers. I'm going to show you one more. Now, okay, in his hand, he's got a drill. You think they want a hole? I don't think so. What does this guy want? Or this girl? I think it could be a lady. So what does she want? She wants the pain to go away. And listen, guys, this is the point. In all of your businesses, you could, you could have 10, 20, 100 different customers all buy exactly the same suite of services from you. But if you really drug, dug into it and had a conversation with them on the front end to ask them what it is they're looking for and what inspired them to look for whatever it is you're doing, each of them would give you maybe a similar but with different subtleties of variation. And in the asking and in the listening, they feel heard, they feel understood, they begin to trust, and now you can start to make a presentation around how your thing helps them get what they want because you're not assuming what they want. You've actually heard it from their lips to your ear what it is they're looking for, and now your presentation. And you're, you're, you're pro so it's not about being manipulative. It's not about forcing a sale. It's not about forcing an outcome. It's about connecting with them on their level, and when you do that, They'll explain and express everything you need to know to be successful with them. And then it's not selling. And I'll take you into a conversation I had with a, with a client of mine, actually just yesterday. He says, man, I'm not much of a salesman. And I said, and that's exactly why you've been so successful. Because a good salesperson, a good business person is really one who listens, understands, and educates. And if you can do that. So if you're on this call, you're listening to this right now. If you can listen, if you can ask, if you can listen, and if you can understand, then you can educate how your thing does what they need. It comes down to asking, listening, and educating. That's it. It's very simple. It's very simple. But of course, there's a structure around that. We have to break some old habits and create some new habits, and that's really what I specialize in doing. So did you want to drill or a hole? The answer, neither. <laughs> All right. So, you know, what value do you bring to your customer? What happens when they buy? I want you to start thinking about this. You know, I, like I heard the, I can't remember your name, the comedian basically said, well, I pick up the phone, I ask them what they want and, and you know, I get a lot of rejection. If you start with, Hey, listen, we help companies increase their productivity by making their people laugh and get rid of their stress. How would you like an increase in your productivity? So I'm, you know, I'm inventing this. I don't know all the combinations and permutations of what you do. Like Doris, I don't sell, I don't sell artwork. I help you look good on video so you can build credibility with your customers. For example, okay, you, you, how would you like to build more credibility through your Zoom calls to increase your leverage with them and your influence? Well, I'd love to do that. Good, let me show you how I can help you do that. Start thinking in terms of outcome and the value that you bring and not the thing that you do because the thing that you do is just a vehicle to deliver the outcome they're looking for. I hope, I, I, I don't wanna use any more words than that. I hope I've made this abundantly clear for you how, how this whole concept works. All right, so I've developed this, this whole 
uh, shall we call sales process or sales system called the high output sales system, where we take these five critical decisions and we sequence them into a conversational action plan called the sales blueprint. But at its core, there are two fundamental activities attached to it. I mean, there's, there's more than just two activities, but the core of it, where 75% of it lies. Part number one comes down to asking, asking penetrating, thought-provoking questions. Okay, so I, let me tell you a story. I'm gonna t I just want to tell you a, a story about how this worked. So when I was living in Hong Kong, I was global account director for a little company called Cunin Noggle. They were a $40 billion company. I was director of global sales. We had 17,000 employees, uh, 35,000 employees and 17, 1,700 offices all over the world. And I happened to be, you know, I went up the ladder pretty quick because I was pretty good at this stuff. And so by the time I became global account director, I was responsible for spearheading all of our Fortune 500 global accounts. So basically working with international sales teams to coordinate global sales, like Hewlett Packard will have 10 different decision makers sitting in all kinds of different geographies. So working through those salespeople. One of the things that I was charged with, we had never, we'd actually never won the Hewlett Packard tender. Uh, basically, it's a, their, their, their annual freight contract is worth $100, $100 million. Okay, so they don't just, you know, say, okay, listen, I'll give you a try. It's, it's, a, it's a long, laborious process of going through RFQs and RFPs and building relationship. And typically, on an account of that size, it could take you 10 years to penetrate it. And they roll their contracts every three years. And so the expectation is you start building, you start building a relationship with them. They'll eventually invite you to one of their tenders, not granting it to you just to see if you've got the fortitude to get through it. They'll invite you to the second round of 10 and maybe in round three, nine years out, you got a shot at winning some business. So anyway, I spent the better part of three years traveling around the world, meeting all the VPs of logistics, the CEO. I've, I've, been, I've, I've actually sold to Carly Fiorina. I've been in her office, Michael Dell, the rest of them. This is how the process works. Anyway, Hewlett Packard, we had never been invited to their tender list. This one, after, after three years of developing these relationships, when we got a call one afternoon, in fact, I didn't even get a call. It was a DHL post landed on my desk in Hong Kong. And uh, so I opened it up and it was their tender and it was like 400 pages thick. And it was like, that was a big day. Just to be invited was, you know, we were dancing around the office, you know, woohoo, you know, just really overjoyed with excitement. But then, you know, then, then the weight of it, it 400 pages, man, this is going to take us, you know, months to complete doing one of these things. You know, you're going to spend probably 30, 40 grand in manpower, just coordinating your responses and all the rest of this. So here's what I did. I know one thing that my competitor, I also know that probably five or six other companies worthy competitors were invited to this tender, but I know something that none of them knew. Three quarters comes down to trust and relevance and they don't buy price, they buy value. So here's what I did. I got the tender. I picked up the phone and I called the guy that was coordinating it down in Singapore. His name was Lam. And I said, hey, Mr. Sing Lam. And he, yeah, I said, Howard Olson, man, thank you so much for, for sending us that tender. I'm gonna make a commitment to you right now. We're gonna send you the most relevant tender response you've ever had. But in order to do that, I'd like to come down to Singapore and ask you a couple clarifying questions. Would that be okay? Sure. Now, you don't have to fly to Singapore to make this work. You can go to the guy across the street. You can do it with the guy in Burnaby. You know, it doesn't matter where your customer is. It's the principle I want you to pay attention to. So I flew down there. And of course, you know, we shook hands and, you know, you know, Bill had a little bit of rapport, a little bit of chat, drank, you know, in the Chinese way, you drink some tea. And some eventually I said, so Howard, what can I do for you? And I said, well, Mr. Mr. Lamb, I said, it's not what you can do for me. It's what we want to do for you. Um, you know, you've, you've obviously put a lot of thought into this tender. There's 400 pages of questions, financial things, all kinds of things. I said, I really just have one question for you. He said, you came all the way down here with one question. I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, well, what is it? I said, you've put so much thought and, 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 and effort and energy into this tender. My question to you is, what is the one question you couldn't figure out how to put into words that you wish was in there. He paused. It was, it was a long pause, probably only about 20 seconds. It's, it seemed longer than that. And he looked at me, he said, that's a great question. He says, you know, he said, listen, every year from September to December is our peak selling season. Just like the guys that make toys, Mattel toys and Levi's jeans and Lee and all the other consumer stuff, 75% of all sales in the Western world are made in the ramp up to Christmas. He said, the thing that's different about our computers and their toys and their jeans, if we build a computer today and we don't have it sold by basically next month, by the end of next month, we literally lose 
hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, in fact, of, of inventory carrying costs on chips that have been stale data because at the speed at which AMD and Intel is increasing the chips and coming out with new processors, if we build it today and don't sell it by the end of the month, it's worthless to us. And the problem at Christmas, even though the volume of shipments goes up, the volume of ships and the volume of airplanes don't increase. So every year we all are faced with this thing of having cargo left behind on the docks and all of a sudden we're taking huge losses. I said, so I listened to him for a moment and I said, so Mr. Tam, Mr. Lamb, I said, if I heard you correctly, what you're saying is you need a logistics provider that has the financial fortitude to deal with a company of your size, but you're also looking for an assurance that your cargo will always have priority uplift so you're not getting bumped on the dock. Is that correct? And he smiled and he looked at me, he said, Howard, I think you understand. We shook hands, I left his office, I flew back to Hong Kong about a week later. I got a phone call from him. He says, congratulations. We've just awarded you half of our contract. That question and getting to a place where he understood that I understood was worth $50 million in one conversation. And we short circuited the whole thing because every human being on this planet wants to feel heard and profoundly understood. And when you do that and they have confidence that you can deliver, trust goes through the roof and they will choose to work with you. It's not the pitch you make, it's the question and the listening that you do. I said there's two parts to this whole process. One was asking the thought-provoking, penetrating question that gets them to think about their situation in a whole new way. The second part of this process is finding the big idea in the answers that you get back. Now, many of you here in Vancouver or in the, in the Lower Mainland will be familiar with a company called uh, MTI Community College. They're a big client of mine. And I, a number of years ago, I met the founder and CEO. He called me up and he said, listen, we're looking for some sales training. And I said, okay. You know, and I was in my home office and I said, so what, may I ask why? He says, yeah. He says, he says you know, VCC and uh, Shaw, all of them, they, they're, starting to eat into our, they're starting to eat into our margins. And we're, we're, not, we're not as successful as we used to be. And I said, well, I may be able to help you. I said, can we get together? Can we, you know, have a chat? So I, he said, sure thing. So we booked an appointment, went down to his office. And, you know, we, we shook hands and we talked about all kinds of nice things. But eventually, I just said, he says, so what do you think you can do for us? And I said, well, you know, that's a great question. I want you to listen to this because this is what your customers are saying to you. What do you think you can do for us? So they're saying, you know, how do you think you can help us? Or what makes you different? They're going to give you something like that. And I said, you know, listen, we've helped a lot of companies, but that doesn't mean I can help you. What I'd really like to do is ask you a couple of, you know, clarifying questions. Just understand your circumstances. Oh, yeah, you know, what do you, what do you think are some of your greatest strengths? What do you think are some of your greatest weaknesses? Why do you think your people were successful in the past? Why do you think they're not successful now? You know, and so I, he, I asked and he answered and I recorded his answers. And I, he got to, got to a point where he understood that I was listening to him. And I eventually said, so I listened to lots of stuff about, you know, their, how their performance had been suffering, that they'd never been actually properly trained. And I asked him one more question. And I said, listen. If we decide, listen to the language because it's so non-assuming, it's such non-threatening language. Listen, if we decide to work together, what is the one thing that's non-negotiable that must happen in order for you to want to do this with me? He thought about it for a few moments and he said, and I'll never forget his answer. He said, I want more than the Hawthorne effect. Huh? Now, I knew what the Hawthorne effect was because I studied it in industrial psychology. Most people wouldn't know what that is, and most people wouldn't ask what it is. They just say, okay. So anyway, the Hawthorne effect goes back to an experiment in Ohio in the late 70s. In Hawthorne, Ohio, General Electric has a light bulb factory, or at least they did. And they were pumping out thousands, hundreds, tens of thousands of light bulbs a day. But they noticed that the productivity and, and, and the industrial psychologists were looking for a way to get increased productivity from all the people. And they tried all kinds of things and nothing was working. So they started playing with the lights and they figured out that if they could put 10% more current into the lights and brighten the room, every time they did that, the productivity went up a corresponding 10%. So they, they gave the 10% boost and then the productivity went up 10%. But it was a short-lived thing. It, worked, it lasted for two or three days and then it all went back to where it was. So they, they, they put another 10% boost on, productivity rose, but it was a short-term rise, and then it went back to where it was. They kept doing this, getting sh incremental short-term increases on the productivity until they couldn't get any more juice into those lights without them exploding. So they stopped. And they said, well, let's, let's see what happens if we turn the lights down. And they turned the lights down, and productivity went up 10% again. What was the conclusion? The conclusion was that when you pay attention to people, their productivity goes up but it's typically a short-term productivity gain. So what this guy was saying to me, I want more than the Hawthorne effect. He's saying, listen, 
I love everything we talked about. I think you can actually do this, but I don't just want a short-term productivity gain. I don't want a training program that gets my people ramped up for a couple of weeks and then it goes back to where it was. How can you, what he basically, without asking me this question, the question that he asked me, how can I ensure that we're going to get a productivity gain? So I turned my entire presentation talking about the methodologies by which we engage their people so that they actually learn it, harness it, and develop new habits. Now, I could have, you know, listen, based on every customer, I mean, the process that I employ might be the same. But the manner in which I present it to the customer has to be wrapped around what their driving concern is. And the same thing is true for you. So part two is finding the big idea, listening with all intent and being to hear where they're coming from so that you can address their most pressing need and they'll want to come and buy from you. This is not about being a slight sleazy salesperson. This is not about, about you, know, uh, you know, having a hidden agenda. It's about being genuine and authentic about figuring out where they're coming from. And so that's what that's where it's. So we go through this process of asking these thought provoking questions and really listening. But the question is, how are you listening? Like, how are you listening really? Because in all the training that I've done and all the companies that I've worked with, and at one point I had thousands of salespeople working directly for me. I, I could teach them how to ask, but they, many of them never actively engaged or learned active listening skills. And so, because we'll hear things, well, I'm, I want to do this or, you know, I want more than the Hawthorne effect. Listen, if they give you an answer that you're not entirely sure what it means, don't assume what it means. Ask them, clarify. So Hawthorne effect, what does that mean to you? And then they'll clarify it. Or, you know, for example, I could ask you, you know, what's the most important thing when looking, for, when looking for a training company? Well, we want service. But I could ask 20 people what their definition of service is, and I'm going to get 20 different definitions. Ask them to clarify it from their perspective, and now you're on the same page with them, and you can start getting relevant in the way that you present. But it requires that you ask first and present second. And in traditional selling, most people go in and present first and then try to ask a few questions in the end. We're fundamentally flipping this thing on its head. So in other words, my final and closing remarks to you is ditch the pitch and ditch the pitch. This is not about the sales pitch. There is a time to pitch like in the lion's, the dragon's den or the shark tank. You got 10 minutes to get an investor's, you know, pitch then. But when you're, when you're talking to customers, ditch the pitch. It's the questions that you ask and the answers that you receive that creates your relevance in your sales. The power in selling ain't in telling. The power in selling comes from asking, listening with every fiber of your being and confirming that you understand where they're coming from. And that's where trust goes through the roof. And basically that's how you create a deep and lasting ongoing trust. Remember, you are the sale. It's you who creates value. You are the conduit between product and company and customer. It's you who are the core differentiator. It's your applied people smarts that's going to take you to the finish line, not cajoling or forcing a sale. So I just last little thing, you know, Roger suggested that I come with an offer. So I got an offer. I've taken my entire business online and instead of doing a three day intensive workshop in somebody's facility, well, I'm serving the small business community and I got, you know, listen, I'm doing the same thing with my corporate clients. It's all doing virtual now. So I've created a program called the sales success formula. It's five live weekly interactive. So it's five live weekly interactive sessions where we take you through the entire high output sales system, give you a step-by-step -step blueprint to having natural conversations that actually close sales. There's five calls, five training calls each week, and then a day break, and then a coaching and uh, implementation call. Uh, this program includes all current courses, including our flagship program, all future courses, which includes proposals that win, communication style indicator, getting on the same page with your customers from a communication place. I have asked the expert, I'm not going to get, I just, in, in the name of time, I'm just going to speed this up a little bit and then networking for results. So I'm creating an ongoing library of courses that you can take self-paced and this course will also be in there that you can take self-paced, but I record all the sessions and give you special access to go back into the course that you participated in. I never take more than 12 to 15 people because I need it to be small and intimate because I'm really working hands-on with you. And then last but not least, it also includes uh, acceptance and membership in our, in our monthly community and, and coaching mastermind. I'm offering this on a lifetime deal, 695 us dollars for the life of the program. It's yours forever. And as I create new content, you get access to all of that because, and why, so why would I do this? Because the value of a community grows with the size of the community and the more interactive it is, the more value everybody else gets from it.
because the best stuff comes out of me through the questions that I get asked. And so we can learn and we can grow together. And if you're interested, you can go to my website, High Output, book a consultation call with me and let's have a chat, see if this is the right thing for you. And I promise I won't try to sell it to you. I just try to understand your world. And if I can help you, I will. And if I can't, I'd be the first to tell you. And uh, the content, you can see the course curriculum all laid out at, at uh, salesleadershipacademy.online salesleadershipacademy.online or you can get there the back door off my off my high output website so with that i just say thank you very much listen if you'll learn these fundamental tenets of communication you'll become indispensable in the minds and the eyes of your customer and as my friend yoda once said and successful business you will be so with that i say thank you very much and i would love to take some questions Howard, that was awesome. Uh, that was a and awesome I hope that was I hope that was valuable and interesting for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so you, you said oh, you worked my with speaker like, turned off. <laughs> there we go. Can you hear there me? There we go. Now I can hear. Yeah. Um, so that was awesome, man. Uh, really great presentation. Um, you mentioned that you work with um, like uh, Fortune 500 companies quite a bit in the past. Do you yeah. still work with that level of company? Pardon me. Do you still work with Fortune 500 companies even now? Occasionally, I you know I found my sweet spot in the training space uh, is not really the Fortune Five crowd. My sweet spot in the training space is really both the SMB and the mid tier guys. So basically, you know the the ten million guy that wants to get to twenty, the small business owner that I do in public workshops like I just outlined, and the twenty million that wants to get to fifty kind of thing. And that's really my sweet spot because typically they'll have somewhere between ten and fifty business development reps, and then I can work really intimately with them. I what I don't want to do is have to work through sales managers that want to control the whole thing. And so my sweet spot is really in, in the SMB in the mid tier, but yeah, occasionally I'll get a call to work with a, with a, with a major player for sure. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's uh, we'll, we'll definitely talk. <laughs> awesome. I'll look forward to it. There Anything else? Are, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. There are no questions typed in the chat. Howard, uh, your five-week program, is there uh, specific windows of opportunity for those programs? Yeah, so I've got the, the next one starts on October 7th, and it'll, it's going to run every Wednesday for five weeks for two hours, so 10 to 12 every Wednesday on Pacific time. And then once we get through that, I usually take a two-week break, and then I'll start the next intake. So I kind of run it like a college intake program where I'll, I'll take a small group for five weeks, take two weeks off, and then take another small group for five weeks. Excellent. That works great for me. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Okay. You've obviously wowed people. Well, I hope so. I mean, listen, I, I didn't want to just make a, you know, a fluffy presentation. I wanted to give you some meat that you could do something with. <laughs> mm -hmm. Troy, did you have a question? Ed? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Howard, thank you so much for this valuable information and a meeting. Um, I'm definitely interested. Uh, so, uh, we, your conversation was amazing because I felt it like so personal. You used to meet people in person, mm -hmm. convince them, which is a very good part for them to know you. And this is kind of a personal one-to-one -one kind of conversation. What do you think about the digital technology added to this? Um, now it's, a, it's a, in a new era with digital kind of a communication and, and even like a third party where, where he handles automated third party handles the automated like work stuff for example like google kind of advertisements platform right. or something like that so how how do you think is it the same is it following the same system or is is it something like you can talk about Thank yeah you. I, well so there's there's two ways that i can answer that so first of all we look at so let, let's let's take your example of like a google software as a service kind of thing typically the, there's not a whole lot of personal interaction on a, on, on a on a, on a sales process like that, you know, because listen, as a consumer or you as a consumer or a business person, you're going to either decide to use their software suite or you're not, uh, you know, you're going to do a lot of validating by reading their features and benefits and hearing what reading testimonies and things like that. But, but the point here is, is that the ingredients that go into you coming up with a foundation of trust in that service provider, if you go look at their website, if you go, if you go read their content, they're going to be doing a lot of, this. there's going to be a lot of validation about who they are. There's going to be a lot of validation about how their services fix the typical business person's problem. You know, so the principles are still being employed. Now, on the other side of it, 
like I'm still very much, I'm still working with people. I just don't go to their office anymore. And I'm not, I'm not working in a hotel room or a conference center. I'm certainly not on a big stage with several thousand people in the audience anymore. So in that case, we're still using technology to reach out to people. So my clients, I, you know, listen, I just did a, I did a major program for a company that had, you know, people dispersed all across Canada and the United States. So we were tuning in. So we're using technology and the whole sales process. So I had, you know, I was dealing with the CEO a VP and the general manager. It was all done on Zoom, but it was the same process being employed. Tell me, so why you, why, what got you thinking about this? What, got, what, what inspired you to want to reach out and call me? What are some of your greatest challenges? And coming to a place of, so even though I'm not physically shaking their hand, I'm digitally shaking their hand. And even though I'm not personally in their space building that trust, I'm still doing it through the camera, much like I did with you tonight. At least I hope that's what I did tonight. Right. So on a software as a service kind of thing, you know, it, people are going to still be making those decisions based on trust. I trust the company. I trust the product. I see value in the price. Those ingredients are all still there. It's still communication. Right. Uh, and then many of you are in the technology space where you're selling technologies, you know, prospecting and lead generation kind of things. There you're probably going to have some person to person interaction and everything I outlined tonight fits right into that, whether you're doing it over the phone, through Zoom or face to face. I hope that answers your question. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. Howard, I wanted to say thank you uh, for going deeper into the, if you buy a drill, what do you want? We often get a <laughs> hole and you went so much further than that. That was really helpful. And I oh, love it. Well, yeah, you know what? I, I, I just love that analogy. I came up with that a couple of years ago and I use it everywhere I go now because people, it just resonates. So I'm glad that that's true also for you. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, Howard. This was wonderful. Very knowledge, a uh, lot of uh, great information. Oh, great. Well, thanks, Gobinder. Nice to see you, by the way. It's been a while. Yes, it's been a while. Yes. Yeah. Are there any final questions for, for uh, Howard? Karen has one. I actually. Mm -hmm. Sounds like we got two. So, Catherine, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think my question is if you're not getting a lot of people calling you what mm -hmm. is the best way to prospect um following this building trust and and getting deeper in uh the questions that you might ask oh, I well what, give me a little background so what is it you do and who's your typical customer yeah i'm a pronunciation trainer my clients are internationally trained professionals and i work on uh, communication skills with a north american focus with these people are there are there trade associations around that uh, there are industry associations, probably a better way to put it. Yeah. So engineering, yes. Tech has quite a big group of following, uh, certain conferences. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, a website or, you know, anything like that is kind of a static thing that, like I'll generate some leads off my website, but it's not the lion's share of what I, what of, of the, of the lead generation that comes in, you know, very often I also need to pick up the phone and do some prospects. So you have to know who your customer is and you have to know what benefit you offer. So, you know, when you talk about, you know, speak, you know, my, I know my, my dad was Danish and he was very active and became very successful in the, in, in the Toronto business community. In fact, the Canadian business community, but he spent a lot of money on elocution therapy to lose his Danish accent, which, you know, I thought it was part of his charm, but he, he wanted to integrate so that speech would not be an impediment. So you think about that. So now let's go back to that whole concept of outcome. You know, somebody will pick up my dad. Hey, listen, I'll teach you how to speak without, I'll teach you how to speak without, uh, without an accent, maybe not a high value proposition. I'll help you to articulate in a way that speech won't be an impediment to your sex. I'll actually help you improve your success. So, you know, think about what are the typical outcomes that you give to your typical client? And then you gear your prospecting around speaking the outcome that you produce. So for example, when I pick up the phone, Hey, my name is Howard Olson. And listen, I know you weren't waiting for this phone call. I'm, I'm calling in randomly, but uh, you know, I'm in the business of helping companies increase their sales, their revenue and their success rates. You think a company like yours would be interested in something like that? For sure. Great. Who would the best person to speak to about that with? So I can just see if there might be a fit between what we do and what you guys are looking for. And so that's, it's, it's proactive. You know, so part of what I heard in your question, there is a difference between reactive selling where you're responding to a lead that just randomly came in and proactively generating leads. And that's what we call marketing, prospecting, 
you know, lead generation. And as business people, we either have to do it or we have to find somebody who's good at doing it for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's You're really welcome. Marilyn, did you have a question? No, not a question, a comment. I, over the years, I've known Howard since 2005. I think that's when you came back from Hong Kong. I remember meeting you at one of Don Willen's focused networking breakfast at the Sylvia Hotel, and you walked in the room and George Moen said, Hurricane Howard. I just wanted to thank you, Howard, because over the years I have done your program not once but twice, and I have brought a couple of other clients to your program and further occasions. And it's just such a delight to have you back in the fold and on the screen and in mm. my apartment tonight. So I just wanted to say hello and say thank you. Hug Michaela for me. I'll do. Well, I love you, Marilyn, and thank you for that. I, guys, I didn't pay you for that, so I just thank you. No. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, grateful. I'm grateful. You know, listen, it's just we're all just, you know, listen, we all have different skills and we all have different contributions. Like if you look at a body, my nose can't do what my foot can do and my hand can't do what my eye can do. And in, in, in business, we're all here to do the thing that we're really good at to help each other. And this is, this is my thing. And you are bloody good at it, my friend. Thank, <laughs> well, thank you. you. It's now at nine o'clock. Uh, VBN prides itself at starting on time and ending on time. Hurricane Howard, on behalf of VBN and mm. all our guests and their visitors, <clears throat> I thank you enormously. Uh, as many mm. people have said in the chat, this is one of the strongest sales presentations they have ever heard. And I oh, echo that sentiment. Uh, so thank you so, so very much. And well, to our audience, uh, I wish you uh, uh, all the safety and the health and the happiness uh, that the world can offer you. Look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Good awesome. night all. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Awesome presentation, Howard. Uh, thanks, great. Doris.